the attic here. Got a bit of a different one for this one. This might go on for quite a long time. So if you like short videos, don't bother watching the rest of it because this will waffle on a bit. It's about alcohol. And I'm writing a paper for a particular group where we are required to add in some submissions on a regular basis. And I figured I'd do one on alcohol. Now, this is not about this particular group. This is just the submission of it. But it's based on some recent experiences I've had, which actually I've been having for quite a long time as a non-drinker. I haven't always been a non-drinker. I quit probably about 13, 12, 13 years ago, I had a guess. I figured that if I'd carried on at the rate that I was going, I probably wouldn't make it to 50. So it was like, okay, time to grow up, time to stop this nonsense behavior and also save an awful lot of money. So I simply quit. Now at the time, I think people were suspicious. Oh, he won't last a week. That Austin, he won't last a week. Well, here I am 13 years later and I don't think I'll ever go back to it. Simply because I can recognize how much my life has improved in every possible way as a result of not wasting my time um, consuming alcohol. I had so much more free time when I quit. That was the thing that I really, really noticed. I became a lot more productive. Now, here's my observation as a non-drinker. Drinkers have to make a reference to it constantly whenever I'm around them. It's amazing to me what, what it is that triggers people. He doesn't drink. They often want to know why as well. What? Well, I choose not to. I don't take heroin. I don't have to explain myself there, do I? Do I have to go around addicts and say, I don't take heroin because, and explain myself? But a common assumption is exactly that. He doesn't drink, therefore he must have a drink problem. How does that work? I don't, don't take heroin, therefore I must have a heroin problem? I don't get it. I don't understand the mentality that says because I don't do a particular drug, I must have a problem with that drug. Yeah. I wonder if the people saying it might have the problem. Anyway, I'll read you the paper. I'm going to go through some commentary as I go, just for the fun of it. I've entitled this From Labour to Refreshment and Into Dependency. Now, when we catch children taking drugs or drinking alcohol, we tell ourselves they do it because of peer pressure. Our children are sensible. They are intelligent. They're just a bit naive and have been led astray by others who are old enough to know better. I've seen this firsthand myself. It's always peer pressure. Kids don't take drugs because they're great. No, no, no. They take drugs because they were led into it by other people. Okay, interesting explanation. But now, we know the real reason. Alcohol is perfect. Alcohol is great. It's, it's the universal medicine. It is the ultimate adaptogenic medicine. When we want it to relax us, it relaxes us. When we need courage, it gives us courage. When we need a boost to party all night, it gives us that boost. When we need to sleep, it offers us sleep. When we require romance, it offers us romance. When we need style, it gives us styles shaken but not stirred. And when we need a friend, it is always there for us, offering us social salvation with or without other people. No other drug offers such versatility. Alcohol consumption has shaped culture. It is readily embraced by society. It provides a steady stream of taxation revenue uh, for governments. It offers a ready hobby for the home brewer, exquisite flavors for the connoisseur. It breaks the ice for the socially awkward and has been enabling the sexually anxious to get laid for millennia. Alcohol brands sell us the perfect image of the perfect drug. Groups of enthusiastic and loving friends, relaxing tropical beaches, suave sophistication and soft lighting. Curiously, though, they don't show us the image of the drunks in the city parks, the arguments and the fight, the liver, liver failure and the cancers, the wrecked marriages and failed careers, lonely people, hangovers, dry skin and chronic anxiety. Now, I worked in the front line of an inner city hospital's accident and emergency department for a few years. Along with my colleagues, we knew every police officer by name. Not because of the accidents, but because of the frequency by which they would be in the department to attend to our en endless stream of angry, stinking, aggressive, and suicidally violent drunks. We used to get all the threats, the spitting, the puddles of piss on the department floor, the breaking of valuable and vital medical equipment, and kit. We had two types of drunk, the binger and the chronic. The bingers were functional by day and fighters by night. The chronics were a mess 24-7, and yet so few of them were under the age of 40. The youngsters who attended drunk usually had a broken ankle, mostly young women in stilettos trying to navigate a loss 
Oh, pages stuck together. Try that one again. The youngsters who attended the who attended drunk usually had a broken ankle. Most of young women in stilettos trying to navigate a loss of coordination and concrete steps. Or a broken hand, this was usually the younger guys, which usually matched another casualty's broken cheek, a hole in the wall somewhere, or a hole in the wall somewhere. I don't recall a single untoward incident towards the staff or department equipment from any of them. Now, just a commentary on this one. This is absolutely true. In all the time that I worked in frontline stuff, dealing with members of the public at their first point of entry, um, we saw the whole range of people, the whole range of behaviours. But the angry, aggressive and antisocial behaviour towards the staff, towards the department, towards the equipment, I never ever saw it come from the younger people. Most of them were actually, might, they might be high spirited, they might be a bit loud, mostly if they're intoxicated, but I never saw any aggression directed towards us. And that was a really noticeable thing. It's, it requires people to hit a certain age before they become a Karen, they become an arsehole, they become entitled and start demanding. Now, bearing in mind, this was 20 to 30 years ago. Um, I know social attitudes have changed now. And we have a whole generation of really entitled brats growing up. But then, of course, every generation says that there's a whole generation of brats growing up who are completely entitled and spoiled. It goes all the way back to Plato and Socrates. They even spoke about it in ancient Greece. Just worth mentioning. Now, it was the over 40s who were the problem, yet they weren't born this way. It usually takes years of self-abuse to become one of them, the other, the not one of us, the estranged, the bitter, the angry, the lonely, and the dysfunctional. But we never saw them behave that way when they were sober. The agencies that were peripheral to our department, the probation, the alcohol advisory, the rehab, homeless support, etc., they all told us the same story. When sober, most of these regulars that we saw were kind, empathic, but deeply damaged individuals. They were caught in a vicious cycle. Alcohol was taken as the universal medicine to solve their assorted pains and existential suffering. Over time, two things happen. This pain and suffering is never addressed. It is never resolved, or d nor do they grow out of it. It is merely masked. And the continual consumption of alcohol brings about more existential suffering through both biological and sociological mechanisms. This in turn leads to greater consumption. Now, who are these people? There is actually a simple answer. They are simply customers. They are repeat customers. They are excellent customers. They are the best customers. In 2020 to 2021, the British government collected 12.12 billion pounds in tax revenue alone just from alcohol sales. Just let that number sink in. Now, the government are not the only entity to profit from alcohol sales. The alcohol industry in the UK is worth billions, and that's a literal figure, billions. Without these drunks, the company directors would not be able to own their luxury yachts, their multi-million pound homes, and other trappings of extreme wealth. But good on them, right? They're not to blame for the idiots who cannot handle their drink. People just need to demonstrate more responsibility. After all, every alcohol container in the UK has a slogan to remind us to drink responsibly. Just like the pro-gun slogan, guns don't kill people, people kill people, alcohol does not kill people. People kill themselves using alcohol. They just do it a lot slower than using a handgun. And after all, there's nothing wrong with alcohol. It is the universal medicine. It's not like heroin. We know heroin is bad. We tell everyone to avoid heroin. It's addictive, it wrecks lives, and it turns people into street prostitutes and thieves. We don't expect people to be able to handle the heroin. It's, alcohol is not like crack. We know that's bad. We tell everyone to avoid crack as it, as it is addictive. We tell them this because it's addictive and heavily associated with gang crime and the destruction of inner city society. We don't expect people to be able to handle their crack. It's not like spice, the newest one that's on the streets. We know that's bad. We tell everyone to avoid spice because it is addictive and damaging to the brain and mind. It makes us crazy and is heavily associated with self-destructive behaviour and madness. We don't expect people to be able to handle their spice. I could go on. It's the same story for almost all other intoxicants. But this is never the story with alcohol. When someone is unable to handle at their alcohol, we blame them. Never do we blame the alcohol. Alcohol is blameless. It is perfect. It is the consumer that is the problem. 
never this particular drug. We tell them that moderation is key. We tell this to ourselves and we tell it to others. We measure the morality of alcohol not by its consumption, but rather we measure it by its volume and frequency of consumption. For example, when a young associate tells us he only takes heroin at weekends and only in moderation, we may well find ourselves feeling concerned. No one says heroin is, fu heroin is fine in moderation. No one says crack is just fine in moderation. The reality is they probably are. We hold these drugs to account for their destructive nature, but we never hold alcohol to account for its own inherent destructive nature. Yet in the UK alone, we have some very disturbing trends. In England, not in the greater part of the UK, just, just England, there were 347,761 hospital admissions that were alcohol-specific in 2019. That's a rate of 644 per 100,000 population. And this made up 2% of all hospital admissions. There is significant regional variation. For example, the highest rate in England during this time was of 2,590 admissions per 100,000 people. And that had occurred in Southampton, where I used to work. Almost eight times greater than the lowest one, the lowest rate of 331 admissions, which took place in Redbridge. Now, Public Health England published an evidence review on public health burden of alcohol in England in 2016. And they reported... Among those aged 15 to 49 in England, alcohol is now the leading risk factor for ill health, early mortality and disability, and the fifth leading risk factor for ill health across all age groups. The alcohol death rate is relatively high across the UK, with liver failure being the leading cause, but this isn't the biggest concern. The biggest problems arise from the secondary health effects. When it comes to mental health, depression and anxiety are exceptionally common. Ironically, most of the drinkers in this group are caught in a vicious cycle of drinking alcohol to quell their anxiety in order to bring about short-term relief, at the cost of increased anxiety and mood disorders in the long term. Additionally, heavy drinking the night before can lead to a hidden yet subtle and accumulative problem the following day. Most drinkers, most drinkers acclimatize to the constant hangover. We see noticeable and measurable reductions in mental performance, social awkwardness, poor concentration, low confidence, poor memory skills, irritability, and so on. But it's okay, because relief is at hand. And it's just a short time away. Six o'clock is soon going to be here. And the tough day can be soothed away by opening yet another bottle. It's the thought and anticipation of doing this that gets the person through their unnecessarily difficult day. Ah, and relax. And repeat, and repeat, and repeat. Sleep dependency is another problem. Take any sleeping or sedative drug for more than three days, even if you sleep normally, and then don't take it on day four. Sleep won't come too readily. This is a normal and common effect and a major cause of dependency of any sleeping medication. That, and the fact that many of these sleeping medications are themselves highly addictive by their very nature, which is why doctors so rarely prescribe them these days. But it's okay, because the universal medicine is at hand. The dispensaries are everywhere, from the corner shops and pubs to the supermarkets and garage forecourts, and the peddlers and salesmen will never turn you away, no matter how much you shake as you hand over the payment. It's the universal medicine and must never be blamed. We don't blame ourselves either. After all, we're not the ones spitting on the hospital staff or pissing on the floor. We aren't the stinking smelly vagrant in the city park that everyone pretends they can't see. Because we work hard, we are good people, so we're not like them. We just enjoy a drink to relax. We like to share a drink with friends. We like a drink to help us with our stress and sleep. We just like a drink. As a former healthcare professional and now therapist and lecturer in mental health, I see a lot of people with problems. One common trend I see is that so few heavy drinkers attribute their problems to their alcohol consumption. Alcohol is never to blame. Alcohol is perfect. Alcohol is not their problem. Alcohol is the solution to their problem. I see the same things with the cutters, young people slashing up their arms and inner thighs. To them, that behavior is not the problem. This is how they cope with their problems. I see the same thing with the anorexics. These young people starving themselves is not their problem. It's the solution to their problem is how they cope. The comfort and binge eaters are just the same. 
the overconsumption is not their problem as far as they're concerned it's how they cope with their problems it's how they bring about positive feelings nobody but therapists profit from self-harm or starvation but much like the alcohol industry the ever burgeoning food industry profits enormously from people who are overeating but none of these behaviors are seen as socially acceptable. It is not behavior that society sanctions or encourages, and when our children do it, we despair. We don't see supermarkets, garages, corner shops, pubs, or nightclubs selling deliberate self-harm kits in the form of little blades and strips. but we do sell them, see them selling self-harm in bottles. Think about this. If we were to be selling and profiting from deliberate self-harm kits marketed to the young adult we could have the same slogan. The kits don't cut people, people cut people. If people can't handle these kits, then they've got a problem and they need to deal with that. The kit is perfect, there's nothing wrong with the kit. We wouldn't find that acceptable. And yet we continue the narrative at a national level, cultural level and social level that alcohol is perfect, it must never be blamed. The people who have a problem with it, there's something wrong with them even though there is literally millions and millions of them around the world and the death rate is astonishing. And the secondary effects of the health issues, the predilection to various diseases and cancers and so on, um, well, that's just, we just don't really want to talk about that. That's always someone else. It's never us or our people. It's somebody else that has a problem. The social acceptability and consumption masks a massive hidden problem. Problem drinkers who do not have pictures in their head of vagrancy, bankruptcy, liver cirrhosis, chronic anxieties, and insomnia. The alcohol marketing machine makes sure that we only see community and friendship, warmth, love, and comfort. They don't show us images of inner city turmoil, the war zones that many city centers become at weekends, the chaos presented to accident and emergency department. The brainwashed customers repeat the narrative. Alcohol is perfect and must never be blamed. So what's the point of all this? Well, if you think you might be drinking too much, the narrative is going to suggest it's because there's something wrong with you. Now, as a human who is otherwise functional in society, people don't like admitting there's something wrong with them. And the, the picture we have is of the alcoholic who goes to meetings and says, Hello, my name is Andy and I'm an alcoholic. My last drink was 25 years ago. Don't understand that. Um, and that's the image. And so people go, well, I'm not like them. Therefore, I'm not an alcoholic. Because the label alcoholic is loaded with a whole bunch of stuff that in no way the marketing of alcohol, which is a marketing industry of alcohol, is massive. The food industry is even bigger in its marketing budgets is a constant narrative and stream that basically says this is good this brings about warmth and community it builds community it builds friendship and yet i have known plenty of people who have had community and friendship destroyed by some stupid argument some stupid affair some stupid momentary liaison in the bathroom in the toilet the bathroom or whatever party place that they would never have done when they were sober and they beat themselves up for it or just go further into to denial. They never think, well, maybe the alcohol is affecting my rationale. Alcohol is affecting my health. It's affecting the way I think. And it's affecting my friendships. People don't think like that because they're given a story that is entirely opposite. I do not believe that people get pr alcohol problems because there's something wrong with them in the same way that I don't believe people are obese because they're greedy. I used to, I won't deny that. But the more I've worked with people with eating issues, what I realize is they're a victim of a false narrative. They're the victim of massive scale brainwashing, otherwise known as advertising. And let's face it, these advertisers invest incredible sums of money in testing what works. They're not just random images. Hey, come and look at our stuff. No, no. These are absolute experts on influence. They are basically hypnotic agents. They are mind brainwashing mind control agents, for want of a better term, but that sounds a bit too conspiracy theory. It is a conspiracy theory to make people spend more money and consume more, because the more people consume, the more profits there are to be made. Now, the alcohol industry is exactly the same. It is constantly pushing for people for excess consumption and is constantly fighting against the, the notion that there's something inherently wrong with the drug.
If we marketed heroin or crack cocaine or any other intoxicant in the same way, no one would find that acceptable. We still have certain drugs where there are there's vested interests. So, for example, if we look at the evidence for the safety of cannabis products, the countries that have legalized those, what they have seen is massive improvement on every possible demographic that can be measured. Everything improves. And yet we still lock them up in prison because they're criminals. And yet on every street corner, in every street, every high street, absolutely everywhere, there are dealers of another drug that society says, oh, that's okay. We don't see them as drug dealers. We don't see them as peddlers. We don't see them trying to attract in young people by getting them hooked early. Alka pops anybody? That's a huge industry. Alcohol is perfect and it must never be blamed. Well, maybe if you find yourself drinking too much, if you're in that situation of worrying about your intake, you should actually re-evaluate the story you've been sold. The drug itself clearly is addictive, otherwise we wouldn't have so many dependent addicts. If it wasn't addictive, we wouldn't have so many dependent addicts. It is not that there's something wrong with the individual, it is just the drug, there's something wrong with it. Peace,